Hi, thanks for joining me for All About Platonism. My name is Nindy Mandel. Today we're going to be looking at Euthydemus. Now some of you may be saying, what's going on here? Because last week, at the end of last week's video, I had said we'd be looking at Cratylus this week. Let me explain why I changed my mind. So I actually have all the screens made up for the Cratylus, so I will be doing that one next week. But I decided that Euthydemus actually carries on a lot of the same themes that I talked about last week with Phaedrus. And so it makes more sense to do this one this week, and that's why I decided to change them. So Euthydemus deals with the difference between rhetoric and dialectic, and it looks at the public images of what it means to do dialectic versus what Socrates actually means. So. This one is a good one to do this week, and I hope you enjoy it. So let's get into it. So our main characters here, it starts off with Socrates and Credo. And like with many other dialogues, this one is a flashback, and Socrates is telling the story. Now what happened in this story is that the day before, Socrates was at the Lyceum with a boy named Clinius. And Clinius is a young um, cousin, I think it is, of Alcibiades. And he was, and they got into a conversation with two rhetoricians, or we might call them debaters today, um, Euthydemus and his older brother Dionysodorus. The name Dionysodorus sounds like a dinosaur, doesn't it? I always want to say Dionysodorus Rex. But anyway, okay. Um, these two brothers have a skill and they think they're very clever because they're very good at wordplay and they're rhetoricians. So they get into a discussion with Socrates and Clinius. Credo wanted to hear the conversation. He was actually at the Lyceum the day before, but there was such a big crowd, and apparently these two brothers who do their kind of rhetoric, or what they call dialectic, are so popular. They got this huge crowd, people cheering. Credo couldn't hear a word of it. And so here it is the next day, and he asks Socrates what had what the conversation was about. And by the way, I also added the name Stesippus at the bottom because he's another character who has some speaking lines in this dialogue, although actually I'm not using any quotes from him today, but he is another speaking character. So here's the basic setup of how the conversation unfolds. Now you'll notice here that I have two sections that I called intermissions. And like we see with some other dialogues that have tangents, like um, the Protagoras and also the Mino has one, even though in the conversation it seems like something that's sort of breaking away, it actually it's in that section that Plato is able to advance the conversation a bit more. And we'll see the same thing happens here with these intermissions. Of course, I don't know what's, what Plato was actually thinking when he wrote this, so I can't say in any definite way why he organized it this way, but I can think of two reasons why it's quite convenient and why I'm glad he did it. One, we're going to find very quickly that Euthydemus and Dionysodorus are actually quite annoying, quite frankly, to put it bluntly. They, their wordplay is rather sophomoric. It's it's stuff that most of us outgrow by the time we finish elementary school, but it seems like back in the day this was popular because they had quite a crowd cheering them on. But I think most modern readers are going to find it kind of annoying. And so if the whole dialogue was just that wordplay, it would be nonsense and nobody would want to read it. And that also brings us to the second reason, because if that's all they do is this wordplay, their role is to show this false sort of dialectic, then, well, it would be very hard for Plato to advance anything intelligent or thoughtful in a conversation with these two men unless Plato were to take them out of character. And so the intermissions allow Socrates to interact with a different character and to have a more intelligent conversation. And so we're going to find that the intermissions and also the ending where Socrates and Credo are talking is really where the dialogue advances. Okay, with that in mind, let's start with the introduction. And so this is where Socrates and Credo are talking. Credo's explaining that he wanted to hear the conversation, but he wasn't able to. 
And all of our translations today, by the way, are by the translator W.H.D. Rouse. Socrates asks, Who was it, Socrates, you were talking to yesterday in the Lyceum? There was such a great crowd about you people that I, myself, wanting a hair, could not get any nearer or hear anything clearly. And so then he tells him about the two men that he was talking to. And he says that they've become so skillful in wordy warfare that they can confute with equal success anything which anyone says, whether true or false. So they have a good, they have very good skill with rhetoric, what we might call debaters. And so that brings us to his conversation with Euthydemus and Dionysodorus. So Socrates describes them this way. He says they know everything about war, as much as is needed for becoming a general, all about tactics and how to lead an army and how to fight in full armor. And moreover, they can make a man able to defend himself in the law courts if he is wronged. So they know how to fight, and they also, it seems, know how to fight with words. And we're going to see this last part is going to be quite significant throughout the dialogue, because this idea of being able to write speeches that are read in court comes up again and again throughout dialogue. All right, so Socrates, so let me go back, sorry, I forgot. Um, so the two men say that these skills that they had learned in the past are actually things that they no longer focus on. They call these a sideshow, and they say they have a new show that is their main point, and that's where this quote comes in. So Socrates wants to know what is this fine show that is now the main one, and Euthydemus tells them that it's virtue. We believe we can impart, we can impart virtue. No one in the world can do it so well or so quickly. So Socrates is very interested in this, and he starts talking to both brothers, and here's a bit of his conversation with Dionysodorus. He says, so you, Dionysodorus, would be the best people in the world to incline a man toward philosophy and the practice of virtue? And Dionysodorus says, yes. And then Socrates says, very well, leave the rest of the demonstration for another time. And just to demonstrate this one thing, persuade this young man, remember he's with Clinius, the young cousin of Alcibiades, persuade him that he must love wisdom and practice virtue, and you will oblige me and all these, all the people around them. So this is how Euthydemus starts off. He says, now Clinius, which of mankind are the learners, the wise or the ignorant? And there's a bit of back and forth. Clinius is not sure. And then at some point, he says, this is Socrates is uh, narrating the story here. He says, just then Dionysodorus leaned over to me and whispered in my ear, smiling all over his face. Now look here, Socrates, I prophesy that whichever the lad answers, he will be refuted. And so right then Socrates realizes that these two men like to play word games. And so like in this example, they're playing on the idea of learning two senses of the word, because when you hear something the first time, you're learning it. But also, as people in a wisdom tradition, we know that learning also means going over things that you have already been introduced to and trying to get a deeper hold on it. That's also a sense of what you mean by learning. And so they can play on those two meanings and say, is it the wise who learn or the ignorant? So this goes on for a little bit. There's some back and forth, and Clinius is getting uncomfortable. So Socrates saves him by explaining what's going on here, and he calls what they're doing a game. And Socrates says, I call it a game, because if one learned many such things, or even all of them, one would be no near knowing what the things really are. Remember, that's what dialectic really is about. But they would be able to play with people because of the different sense of the words, tripping them up and turning them upside down. And that brings us to the first intermission. So Socrates wants to demonstrate to Euthydemus and Dionysodorus what kind of conversation he's hoping that they will make with Clinius. And so here there's an exchange between Socrates and Clinius. And here's a piece of it. Socrates says, consider the dangers of the sea. Surely you don't think that anyone has better fortune than wise pilots as a general rule? And Clinius says, of course not. Well then, on a campaign, on a military campaign, 
Which would you like better to share danger and fortune with, a wise captain or an ignorant one? And Clinius says a wise one. And they go on a bit more like this, and then they come up with this general rule. When wisdom is present, whoever has it needs no more good fortune than that. And this dialect does have a few good one-liners like this. So this is the general rule that comes out of this first intermission. And then Socrates sums it up this way. He says, my dear Clinius, the truth is that in all those things which we said at first were good, and they had mentioned things like being handsome or having social status, wealth, the usual sorts of goods. He says, for those things, the question is not how they are in themselves naturally good, but this is the point, it seems. If ignorance leads them, they are greater evils than their opposites, inasmuch as they are more able to serve the leader which is evil. But if intelligence leads and wisdom, they are greater goods, while in themselves neither kind is worth anything at all. Okay, so that's what we take from that first intermission, as I called it. And now we're going to go back to Euthydemus and Dionysodorus. And Socrates was hoping that they would now pick up this line of questioning and continue with Clinius. However, instead, they show off their witty wordplay, and this is an example of it. So Dionysodorus asks Socrates, Is there soul in things which have sense, when they have sense, or have also the soulless thing sense? Socrates says, Only the things with soul. Then do you know any phrase which has soul? No, indeed, Socrates says. Then why do you ask me just now what sense my phrase had? They seem to think this is very clever, and the audience seems to think so too, but, well, we understand now why we want to go on to intermission number two. So here Socrates again starts to question Clinius, and I put in parentheses here, and credo. Because at some point in Socrates' narrative, Credo cuts in and says, Now, Socrates, that answer you claim that Clinius gave you is rather deep for a child to come up with. Did he really say that? And Socrates, perhaps a bit tongue-in-cheek or with a wink, says, and yeah, he doesn't quite remember well. So let me ask you some questions, Credo. And then at that point... They step outside of the narrative, and he starts questioning Credo. But for my quotes here, I pulled out a little bit of his interactions with Clinius. And this is because it again brings back that whole issue of speech-making. Socrates says, well, if we should learn the art of speech-making, tell me in heaven's name, is this the art which when we got will make us happy? So they're looking for it. What arts could they learn that would make them happy? Remember, we saw in intermission number one that wisdom is the only thing we need to have good fortune. And now we're looking for what is the art that makes us happy. But Clinius does not think it's speech-making. And Socrates asks, what's your evidence? He says, I see certain speech-makers who do not know how to use the speeches which they make themselves. There are others able to use the speeches which the others have made, some who are themselves unable to make the speeches. So it is clear then that, speech is also, that in speeches also, making is one art and using is another. Okay, so there are some people who are good at writing speeches, some people who are good at making them. And Socrates says, I think you give proof enough that the art of the speech makers is not that which anyone gets, you will be happy. However, I did think that somewhere about here would appear the knowledge which we have been seeking so long. For indeed, the men who make the speeches when I meet them do seem to me to be super wise, Clinius, and their very art seems to be something divine and lofty. However, that is nothing to wonder at. For it is a portion of the art of enchanters, but falls short a little. For the enchanter's art is the charming of adders and tarantulas and scorpions and other vermin and pests. But this is really the charming and persuasion of juries and parliaments into any sort of crowds. 
So we saw in the first intermission that wisdom is what gives us good fortune. And now we're seeing that there's something about the speech makers that seems to be wise. Although perhaps it's not quite that. They're more like charmers or enchanters. And that brings us to the end of intermission number one. And so we go back to Euthydemus and Dionysodorus. Now they do more of their wordplay. The only thing I pulled out here is this one line that I think is worth focusing on. Where Socrates tells them that I think you two work out your dialectic perfectly, as good craftsmen do with their jobs proper to each. So what we see here is that Socrates is calling what they do dialectic. But notice he says your dialectic, because what they're doing is definitely not Socrates' dialectic. And he says that they are like craftsmen. They work it out. This is a skill that they've developed. They're not doing an art, in other words. But he's using that lofty word dialectic to kind of, and he kind of masks what he's saying here. So I wanted to point that one out. And then at the very end of the speech, the audience explodes. They're applauding. Everyone is so excited and happy. And Socrates starts to gush about how great it was. But very quickly, we realize that his compliments are served on the back of his hand, so to speak. Here's a piece of what he, of his compliment. He, he says, your speeches are full of fine things, Euthydemus and Dionysodorus. But most magnificent of all is this, that you do not concern yourselves with the multitude of men, nor men of solemn looks or great reputation, but only with those like yourselves. Ouch. For I am quite sure that there are very fine men like you who would appreciate these arguments, and all the rest know so little of them that they would feel more ashamed to refute others by such ways of speech than to be refuted themselves. And so that's where we're going to leave Euthydemus and Dionysodorus. But now Socrates and Credo are going to talk about that whole conversation that had just taken place. Now remember, Credo had actually been there at the Lyceum. He just was not able to get close enough to hear what the conversation was. However, Credo tells us that he did get a chance to have a word or two with a man who had been standing a bit closer, an intellectual. And this man says that if Credo had been closer, he says, you might have heard men using dialectic who are the cleverest men alive of those engaged in such speaking. And Credo asks, what did you think of them? And the man says, think of them? What anyone would think who heard such people talking nonsense and making an unworthy fuss about matters worth nothing at all. So what we see here is that this man thinks that what um, what Euthydemus and Dionysodorus were doing was dialectic. He doesn't say it was their dialectic, he just called it dialectic. So this is the common image, it seems, at least according to this dialogue, this is the common image of dialectic in Socrates' day. People did not appreciate philosophy as it, as it should be done, as the way Socrates did it. And so they thought this was what philosophy and dialectic are about, about being clever. So these two men were just clever. They're not wise. And so I like to call them clever fools. And so we see here, first of all, that this is the common image of dialectic in philosophy. But then we also are going to find that this man is an intellectual sort. And this is a bit of the exchange between Socrates and Credo about this man. Socrates asks, was he one of those skilled in contesting cases in court, an orator, or one of those who send such people in, who compose the speeches which the orators deliver? And Credo says, not an orator, no indeed. I don't think he ever went up into a court of law. But I assure you they say he understands the business. He's a clever man, composes clever speeches. So once again, this idea of the speech makers who, who write the speeches that are delivered in court, this idea keeps coming up throughout the dialogue. We saw that Euthydemus and Dionysodorus are trained in this field. It came up again went in, I think it was the second intermission, 
And now we see it again here at the end. Socrates describes these men, these speech writers, as the frontiersmen between philosophy and politics. And he says it is quite reasonable if they think themselves wise. They know they are moderately well up in philosophy and moderately well up in politics, quite reasonably, for they have as much as was wanted in both. And they keep clear of both danger and conflict while they enjoy the fruits of wisdom. So it takes a bit of um, experience or skill reading Socrates to read between the lines and understand what he's saying, and it takes a bit of familiarity with him. But what he's saying here, it sounds on the surface like he's saying something positive about them. But look more carefully here, because what he's saying is that they think themselves wise, and they have as much as they want in both, or as was wanted by them. So they keep clear of danger and conflict, meaning that they don't go deep enough to really stir anything up inside themselves or to create any problems or to stir things up in society in the case of politics. But they enjoy the fruits of wisdom, meaning they have the reputation or the image and they believe themselves to be wise. So they think it's clever to dabble just a little bit excuse me, just a little bit in both. He goes on to argue that both philosophy and political action are good, but each aims at a different thing. And then he says that in reality, these persons, these speech writers, who partake of both, are worse than both for each thing which politics and philosophy are important for. And although they are really third behind philosophy and politics, they try to be thought first. So after all this talk, now Credo complains that, you know, his, he's got two sons and the oldest one is ready to begin his education. But you look at all these sophists and these rhetoricians and all these supposedly clever people and you find that uh, none of them really impress him. He says, when I glance at any one of those who profess to educate people, I'm horrified. Each one I look at seems to me to be quite unsuitable, to tell you the truth. So I don't see how I am to direct, to direct the boy to philosophy. And so what we've seen throughout this whole dialogue is this play between the image that people have of philosophers versus what they really do. The image of dialectic versus what it really is. The image of what it means to be wise versus what it really is. And so Socrates is going to wrap up all of this in his answer to Credo, and this is how the dialogue ends. For Socrates says to Credo, Do not trouble about those who practice philosophy, whether they are good or bad, but examine the thing itself well and carefully. And if philosophy appears a bad thing, turn every man from it, not only your sons. But if it appears to you such as I think it to be, then take courage, pursue it, and practice it, as the saying is, both you and your house. And so that's his advice to Credo and Plato's advice to us. And so that's where we wrap up today, and I do hope you enjoyed that. And if you have any questions or comments, as always, I invite you to drop me an email or put a little note in the comment section. Also, as always, please think about subscribing and giving it a thumbs up and sharing with your friends. Next week, we will be doing Cratylus. It's a really good dialogue. It's going to take us into a bit of etymology, but also there's a whole lot more going on there. So I look forward to that one, and I do hope you'll join me. Thank you very much.